Well, thanks for being here. We're really excited for our presenter today. And um, before we get started in introductions, we'll just do a couple quick announcements. We have Forward Fest coming up in August, so make sure that you check in regularly on the Forward Fest website to kind of see what's happening there in our community. New events are being added. We'll be doing the Ven Fair via One Million Cups. So it's really a collection of all the ecosystems within the startup community here and a pretty cool event that Dennis and Alan have have led over the years and have entrusted in our care this year. So uh, hopefully we'll make them proud. Any other announcements? Um, Culture Community, we have an event next Thursday in this room, same time, same place. So come to One Million Cups next week, then come the next day for Culture Community. You'll feel like crazy deja vu, but it's gonna be really good. We have um, Sarah Young, the founder of Zing Collaborative, and she's talking about having a culture of accountability and not just getting things done, but getting the right things done, and being accountable to your team as well as yourself. And tonight at 100 State, there's a freelancer spark meetup, Matt Nelson's group. Um, they're talking about legal do's and don'ts for freelancers, which I was supposed to be at, so instead of making the announcement, so maybe you can do that. <laughs> Excellent, and then I will not be here next week. Um, I am going out of town. I'm actually gonna see this lady in New York City on Friday, randomly, <laughs> talk about those crazy Wisconsin connections. Um, but you'll be here to hold down the fort, and you'll be here? Yes, we'll be here. We'll do you proud. Yes, <laughs> and no doubt. <laughs> Um, all right, I'm Rachel Neal, I'm with Carex Consulting Group. I'm Leah Rowe, I'm with Health Bench and also Culture Community. I'm Drew Corson with uh, Carex Consulting Group. I'm Dennis Barnum with Merlin Mentors, and just a quick part, uh, what she's talking about is the opening day event of Forward Fest, it's called the Badger Startup Summit. It's three events in the morning, we have what's called the Disruptive Revolution, which talks about the various cool things that are happening in the area that you may want to know that there are other people in that area. In the noon hour, we have the Ben Fair, which is to introduce you to the local ecosystem run ably by Drew and, and Rachel. And then in the afternoon, we have what's called Pitch and Replay. It's an opportunity for you to pitch your idea before a small table of people get immediate feedback and then move around table to table to do that up to five times. So it's a good chance to take your idea, pitch it to people, get immediate feedback on it, and hopefully get some uh, relevant feedback. Thanks. I'm Debbie Deutsch. I am with a startup called healthconnect.link, and I'm also with Collider Advocacy. <coughs> and I'm Tamara Songroth. I'm with the website. <laughs> Andrew Gonzalez, <laughs> Old National Bank. Brian Davis, also with Old National Bank. Uh, my name is Diana Pastrana. I'm with m and Office <coughs> Interiors. And uh, at the end of June, June 22nd, we are hosting a talk for small businesses on how to make uh, purchases now, both in office furniture and technology, that can scale with your business, focusing on how to uh, strategically grow. So it's a breakfast thing. If anybody's interested, give me your card and I'll get you an invite. Travis Human, owner of Stray Cat Bicycles. It's a consumer direct bike company based here in Madison. I'm Carla. I have a professional coaching company for women in IT called Carla Marie Coaching. I'm Mike Brewer and I'm with 100 State. I'm Julianne Slesky, Business Development Manager with the Madison Club. I'm Brent, I'm with Growth Chart. I'm Josh, I'm with Growth Chart. I'm Aiden, and I'm with M3 Insurance. I'm Anthony Heller, I'm with Energy Performance Lighting. We do a lot of the stuff, we implement the stuff that Tamara is going to talk about today. I'm Pete Cavi with Merrill Lynch. I'm DP Knuton with Collaborator Creative. I collaborate cl creatively with complicated companies on advertising, marketing, <coughs> and nonfiction branding. I'm Sean McClarney. I work with BDO, the global accounting firm. We have an office on the west side. Hi, I'm Steve Slatton. I'm a technical professional and I'm also involved with business development and I'm job searching. I'm Jeff Legas. I'm a former business owner and uh, looking for my next business. I'm Derek Gepler with Steel 59. Steel 59 is an online video platform for media companies, so we provide software as a service from Alaska to Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Laurel Gosheroy, I'm customer success at Akita Box. Clara Benzo, HR manager at Akita Box. And before we get started, we just want to thank our sponsors, uh, Old National Bank. Thank you so much for providing the coffee from Crescendo. Uh, Field 59 for the live stream and for uh, uploading the videos onto our YouTube channel and the, the library for providing this wonderful space. So with that, I'll hand it over to Tamara. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everybody. Morning. 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 Everybody awake? No. 
<laughs> All right. So this morning what we're going to talk about is something that's super, super simple. And after, after we get done, you're going to be thinking, okay, why didn't I think of this? Like so many other things. Um, I'm going to start out with I've got three simple questions for you. Okay? So question number one is, do you feel more energetic on a day like today when the sun is shining and it, it, it's just beautiful, it's sunny outside, or do you feel more energetic on a day when it's cloudy and dreary and it's in the middle of the winter when we only have like, what, six hours of sunlight anyway on a good day? So a day like today, more yes. energetic? Yes. Yeah. And, okay, so the next question, and this is not a trick question, okay, what color is the sky? Blue. Blue. Very good. And then the third question is what percentage of your day do you spend inside of a building like this or your home? What, just shout out. What do you what do you spend? Ninety. Ninety percent. Ninety percent of your day? <laughs> more than half. Would everybody agree with more than half? Mm -hmm. Okay, so hundred years ago, hundred and fifty years ago, when our forefathers were more of an agricultural society. How much time do you think they spent inside of a building? Probably a lot less. Would you, would you agree with me on that? Okay. So we've agreed on three things. Um, that we feel more energetic on a sunny day. The sky is blue. But we spend a whole lot of time inside. Right? So those are the questions that I had to answer in my mind. And all the rest of the science stuff just goes to support what I already knew deep down inside. That there's something going on with the light that gives me more energy during the day, but I spend a lot of time not with it. Why is that? Okay, so I'm gonna to touch on the science part, but this is just gonna to go to support what you already decided that you knew. Okay, there's three things in your eyes. There's two photoreceptors that are for seeing. They're called rods and cones, right? Day vision, night vision. But then there's another one. So I remember in science class, you know, it, I don't know, probably junior high school or something like that, where they talked about rods and cones and how the eye works. I remember that part, but about 15 years ago, so it's way past when I was in junior high, but um, scientists actually discovered another photoreceptor. And what it does is that it is helping us tell day from night. It's what's helping us decide whether we should be sleeping and go to bed or whether we should be awake and, and you know, in our hunting and gathering mode. So that kind of made sense to me. And then, so it also makes sense to me, like, what part of the visible spectrum of light would make you feel mo most awake and aware? Well, they found out it's 480 nanometers. So this is the spectrum of light. Anybody remember Roy G. Biv, the colors of the rainbow, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, right? So 480 nanometers is what scientists have discovered is what makes you feel most awake and aware. What color is that? Blue. Blue. What color is the sky? Blue. Blue. Is this not intuitively making sense to you, right? Okay. And this is about our circadian rhythm. So what's happening? That photoreceptor I talked about in the eye that they discovered, what it's actually doing is it's turning on and off cortisol, which is the, one, the, the uh, substance that makes you feel awake and aware, and then melatonin. Melatonin makes you feel sleepy, right? So this is just a normal day. So as we look at the black one, that's cortisol. So it starts to ramp up just before six o'clock in the morning. Now this is an average person, right? So remember that we all vary a little bit, but overall, in general, most of us start to get up around six o'clock. It's gonna peak out around nine o'clock, so you all should be in maximum awareness time right now. I got to do the best part of the day. Look down here at three o'clock. Anybody else have a three o'clock slump happen? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's real, um, and there's a real reason why that's happening. Cortisol is starting to drop off, and then you see it really start to bottom out here about, what, 10 o'clock? When do most people go to bed? About 9, 10 o'clock, right, um, on average. And then you'll see it lay low, and then it will start to come up. Melatonin, which is the substance in your body that makes you feel more tired, you're going to see that it drops way off in the early morning. So it's when you're most awake and aware. And then here around 6 o'clock or so, you're going to see it start to increase. And that's also what's going to give you a lot of sleep pressure. That's what helps you to sleep really good at night. You'll see it start to drop off then around 3 o'clock in the morning to start to, to wait. So that's your natural body's reaction. So here's what 
is amazing to me. So we agreed that blue light's very important, right? It's how our body is resetting its clock. But you also told me that you spend 80 to 90% of your time inside of a building. So this is the spectrum of daylight. And particularly, we're talking a lot about the blues here. See how it spikes up there? No surprise, right? The sky's blue. So these are incandescent lights. So these are like the old style bulbs that you screw in. Most people have had them in their home or still have them in their home. Not a whole lot of blue in that. Here's the scarier one. Fluorescent lighting, which is in almost every office building, right? These are the two by fours. They're, they're tube lighting. I mean, they're all over the place. All the schools that you guys redo, right? They're all over the place. Um, do you see anything that's missing compared to daylight? There's a lot of things missing, right? But yet you're spending 80 to 90% of your time underneath of that rather than underneath of daylight. So do you think your body's maybe missing out on something? I think so. So Minimum Lighting Institute, it's very simple what we do. We're researching the effects of energy efficient lighting on human health, productivity, and safety. Um, and then we want to spread that information about what works and what does not work in built environments. So here's what we're looking at. First of all, K-12 schools, and I've got three examples there where we've worked at. Um, senior care, which is some people call it nursing homes, but they prefer the term senior care these days. And then hospitals. So um, first of all, I want to talk about Stoughton. So Stoughton put in these lights that are like this one. And what they do is they come with this really cool control panel and you can change the color of the lights according to what you're doing, okay? They installed it into five classrooms. Um, they did this with a grant from the utility company and from American Paraboo Power Association. We're producing a video about their experiences with this in regular classrooms, and uh, that should be out this summer. We'll put it up on our website. So um, initial feedback on that, though, has been uh, pretty good. We do a monthly survey with the, with the teachers, and I've uh, been looking at uh, the teacher performance along with student performance, and when the school year is up, we'll have that video out. Uh, it's more qualitative in nature. Uh, we're not measuring test scores or anything like that. The Stoughton Schools was in interested to see what kind of effect. I'll tell you, immediate anecdotal results were phenomenal in the kindergarten room that had no outside windows. So if you can imagine a bunch of five-year-old kindergartners, you know, they go outside for recess, wee, they're all excited and all keyed up. They can put on the light that actually pulls the blue out, and it, what it does is that it allows their bodies to, to uh, start producing just a little bit of that melatonin, and it makes them calm right down. So. That was interesting. Well, more information to follow. Don't have all the results. Um, this is the chart where they asked the teachers, have you noticed a difference in the student's ability to concentrate? And more than two-thirds of them said yes. With this sighting, they have seen an increase in the student's ability to concentrate. There's a lot of data out there that supports this. This is not something that we just came up with. Um, just to let you know, the people that we work with are researchers out of Harvard. Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and UW. And we have uh, MDs, PhDs, all kinds of people to support. This is not something that we just picked up on a whim and ran with. This is, there's real science behind this. Um, we also asked them how much they adjust the lighting. They said sometimes because they have the different settings. The, that's another thing. If you put these tools in, how much are they going to use them or not use them? And that's what we want to know because everybody knows when you get a new toy, you play with it a lot, and then the new kind of wears off. So we're just trying to make sure, see what they actually use it for in the classroom. This is um, DeSoto, Wisconsin. So um, DeSoto is all the way over on the Mississippi River. So this is a special needs classroom. Um, these are both the same classroom. It just shows you that they, the, the brighter blue lights and then the lesser blue lights. What we have found in this particular classroom with these special needs children uh, they had a child who was having seizures. And what they found is if they, if the child started to have issues, they pulled the blue light out and it stops the seizures for this particular child, okay? Another thing that they said that I didn't even think about is the teacher told me that she uses this as an indicator so that the kids know when it's time to, like, it's reading time, okay? So when she has somebody go push the reading button on the lights and it's just another cue to try to get them ready to do what our task is ahead. Uh, Des Moines, Iowa, so this is uh, one of my dear friends over there uh, did this in special needs classrooms. Uh, they had wireless controls, and to be quite honest, their wireless controls did not work very well. Um, 
another one of those experiences that real life that you get to see. Uh, but they did have decreased agitation, increased learning, uh, and it was another tool to stop escalating situations. So they have uh, a lot of children with autism. Autistic children will tend to get very worked up and they can get very agitated. I uh, don't know if you know this or not, but in public schools it's a big deal. How do you handle these children because they can start to hurt themselves and hurt others? And it's a huge issue uh, in, in these types of classrooms of how do you handle that. Uh, what they found is that they could switch out the lighting, pull the blue out, and it would de-escalate the situation without any drug, without touching any child, nothing. And to put this in perspective, uh, this is this is about four thousand dollars a classroom, and the people that we were talking to the other day at Wasbo said that's nothing compared to what we pay for the teachers who get hurt or other injury situations. This is talking about nursing homes. So Tweeton is a nursing home uh, just across the border from uh, La Crosse, over in just uh, in Minnesota. It's a fifty-bed facility. We put dynamic lighting, which is like this, but it it goes throughout the day. So if you think. To think about a, a senior care facility, those people are there 24-7, right? These residents never leave. They're inside for the majority of the time. So what we did in there is we literally brought sunshine in. And it goes through the stages. It goes brighter and gets more blue. And then it will go down. Just as the sun would go down, we start to pull the blue out. And it becomes more of a yellow color. And then we dim it down at night. Uh, we put the up lighting in their rooms. It, was, it has a very rich blue content for day. And then the down lighting uh, doesn't have any blue and the night lights have no blue in them. So what we thought it would do is that it would help the residents be more awake and aware during the day and then they'd sleep better at night. What we found is that we were able to reduce falls um, by about a third. Let me put this in perspective for you. Medicare pays $31 billion a year for falls. That's what it costs Medicare. What if we can reduce falls by a third? That's $10 billion. That's just incredible. And that isn't even talking about the, the factors that these are real human people. And falls are not good. They hurt, right? It's not a good thing. They also saw a reduction in anti-anxiety, anti-psychotic uh, drugs. And the uh, reports of sundowners went down by more than 40%, which sundowners is when people with memory care issues, they get very agitated toward the end of the day. And we found that with the installation of this lights, it helps to alleviate that. UW Hospital is the other one that we have going on. So that one is a different situation. So this is for the doctors and nurses who are in the ICU units of the hospital. I don't care what time of day it is. I don't want my doctor or my nurse, if I'm in the ICU, I don't want them being tired and sleepy, right? Because when you're there, that needs to be your day. You need to be on your game when you're in there. This is your job. When you go home, and if it's 7 o'clock in the morning, you need to make sure you've got a very dark place to sleep. Um, but I want them to be awake and aware. So the theory was, is you're more awake and aware, make fewer mistakes. I know I do. So that's what we're measuring up there. Um, I don't have results back yet, but uh, it's ongoing uh, with them. So what's next? Well, we're pursuing more grants to do more nursing homes. Uh, we're going to continue on the research we've got at UW Hospital. Uh, one of the things I really need help with is getting the word out. We've got some pretty cool um, evidence that there's some really neat things that we can do with just lighting. And we know that people are going to LEDs in their office spaces anyway, and all these other places. I mean, that's it's just what's happening. It's based on energy efficiency. But we want to make sure they make wise choices when they choose that, according to the building use. Um, and what, what's the next research? Well, I don't know. What about industrial? Maybe we can increase the safety in industrial settings like so that people don't get hurt, especially on third shift. What about prisons? What if there's an escalating situation in a prison and you can change out the lights and it would totally bring down that escalating situation, how many people would not be hurt? Um, it, it's, a great, it's a great opportunity to just think about the different things that we could apply this for. So with that, that's what we do at Midwest Lighting Institute. And um, I open for any questions that you have about what we're doing or where we're going. Yeah. <clears throat> what is your marketing plan when it comes to sectors that you're actively targeting right now? Well, that's a really good question. We've concentrated so hard on the research part of it and getting that going in the past year that, um, you know, how do you get that information back out to these people to let them know? And we've been staying pretty small, like uh, WASBO, which is Wisconsin Association of 
school of business, school of business yeah. system okay. officials. So that's one. Um, Anthony and I just spoke there last week or the week before um, with them. The hospitals, they like, don't really have information yet back yet, so we haven't even started on that one at all. And then as far as nursing homes, and just now starting to think about how, to, how do I get that information out? Because these results literally just came out about two weeks ago. So my marketing plan needs help. Well, and, and that's why I'm kind of asking the question because I see a, a lot of what you're doing is, one, great story. Thank you. Challenging story. Yeah. Unless people are really smart and pick up on ROI immediate benefits. Um, targeting public institutions or governmental agencies, you know, public schools, things like that. I'm looking at the people around the room saying, do you share this experience? which is slow to move, difficult bureaucracy, budgets already accounted for for the next 15 years, you know, that, that type of stuff. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying that's a challenge. However, private sector, business, where you can find maybe an early adopter who understands the science of it and says, I want this for my assembly plan. They can sign on the dotted line a whole lot faster than make it happen. I mean, in terms of that marketing plan, where do you spend your dollar? I don't have an answer for that, but I'm wondering if, if you have that kind of in mind of, do we go with the long sale or the person who can sign today? So one of the things here is we're a nonprofit, and so our, our objective is not to make sales. Um, our objective is just to get the information back out and a lot of what we're running on is, is, is donations and grants. Uh, one of the things I have done is applied for a grant um, through a, a Medicare fund where they try to make nursing homes better. And what I had proposed to them is then what are the evidence that would come out of that, then they would set up a standard for nursing homes. This would be like through Medicare and their subsidiaries, uh, Institute of Health. Um, but yeah, I mean, I my objective is not to do sales and get sales in it's just to disseminate information but at the same time you're selling that information that's my point you are selling a product and your product is information true true and we need money to stay right, right. What we're doing. Yeah. so i think you just uh answered a little bit of what i was wondering which is you know during your presentation i was trying to decide are you a, a research kind of based firm or are you kind of a consulting based firm but you're non-profit so if, if you kind of get the word out and you and you um kind of hopefully grow believers, you know, community believers, if you will. What is the handoff between your having convinced a firm, an institution, that this is a great idea to execution? Do you, do you then, you know, have a, an army of, you know, electrical contractors or lighting specialists that, that you work with? Or how does that mechanism work to get through to implementation? Right, so that's part of how um, we work with our sister company, uh, Energy Performance Lighting. So what they are is they are a lighting retrofit company. And what they can do then is then they can say, okay, so we could help you, Mr. School District official, um, to put in a lighting system that our nonprofit arm has researched and that we know will give you another tool for your special needs classroom, that type of thing. So that's kind of where the handoff goes. Anthony's company does the sales, yet can refer back to us as having done the research and proving that certain things work. Did okay. that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> have you done any blind or double blind research with regards to, you know, maybe one classroom, the switch doesn't do anything, and one classroom, the switch actually does do something? So um, the study going on at UW Hospital um, has exactly that going on, like there's a before and an after. The proposed study that we'd like to go forward with in schools is exactly that. Um, I'm trying to find grant funding in order to go forward with that. And uh, what we actually measure is student performance, so like concentration, reading skills, and you put one group of kids in the test situation and one group of kids in a normal classroom. <coughs> but yes, that's our intention. Um, as with everything, there's just the, the, you know, money and time, right? Uh, but it's definitely on our list. Okay. Yes. How many people are you? So um, the staff is really me, and um, our board of directors is uh, three people. 
uh, Dr. Richard Moss, who's the Associate Dean at UW Medical School, uh, Rodney Heller, who's the owner of uh, in Energy Performance Lighting, myself, and then our, our advisory board is the Illuminating Engineering Society, um, the guy who heads up uh, one of their departments over there, um, Dr. Stephen Lackley from Harvard and Brigham and Women's Hospital, and then Kurt Zimmerman, who's uh, from the UW School of Medicine. Yeah. I'm just trying to understand how you're working together with high performance lighting. Are you closely associated as partners, or are you going to be a information hub for spokes that they are one of with the you know the goal of having multiple spokes that are linked to you? So um, when Ronnie or when uh, Anthony and I usually present this, we usually go about it that you know we're, we're the knowledge base, being Midwest Lighting Institute, we're the ones who have researched things and have the knowledge on what really works. They're the implementation arm. So they do, they're doing sales in the field, and then they, for instance, like this lighting system that we put in at Stoughton um, High School, um, they actually put it in and you know build for it. I did the training with all of the teachers and the follow-ups. Um, so they do the retrofit, we do the knowledge part. Does that help? Yeah, it does, but I'm trying to understand, is Midwest Lighting Institute going to be a national certification organization that they're certified, these guys in Idaho are certified, these people in Hawaii are certified, or is it, this is my main squeeze and I'm sticking with my date? <laughs> so I guess in the future, yes, I have, a, I have a lot bigger vision, right? I have a vision that there's energy performance lighting companies all over the place because this, to me, this is really important because this isn't, a, this is about people's lives. I, just the, the thought of being able to reduce falls in nursing homes alone, that shouldn't just stay in Madison or just in Wisconsin. I mean, I, that needs to be disseminated across. Um, we're just in the, such the early stages, but I could see us finding energy performance lighting companies to work with in Washington and wherever, because we're never going to be implementers, but we right. need to find people who will work with us to do that. So I really like your science research that you guys have done. When you're going to propose something like this to like a company or a school district or something like that, one thing that I didn't hear you say was the cost difference between the two. Because there's a reason why all these big companies, things like that, use the fluorescent lighting. It's because it's always been, kind of like to his point, built into the budget. That's just what it's going to do. Do you have any research that shows to switch from fluorescent lighting to this would cost X and here's the return, things like that. That's what, that's what a lot of these companies and almost all the for-profit things are going to look at and go, okay, is my ROI going to make up for the fact that now I'm paying X versus Y? Right. And that's a lot of what Anthony does when he goes in to, to sell a school district. I mean, you talk about the options and how much they are and what your return is. Um, yeah. Do you want me to? Based on energy um, efficiency? Yeah. So generally, <clears throat> if you're looking, so to your point, yeah, there's usually there usually is a budget. Um, the reason we go after public sector to kind of tangent off of that, just so I can explain it, private sector always wants to do like ten thousand, twenty thousand dollar pilot projects, whatnot. Public sector is willing to spend five hundred grand today, so it's a longer sales cycle. But there's a much larger project, and I would rather do one five hundred thousand dollar project than fifty ten thousand dollar projects, right? So then to your question, the ROI, right? That's always, that's the question I get. Why am I gonna do this, you know? So there's a variety of LED upgrades. I'm sure all of you have, are aware that when you go into Home Depot now and look at this shelf, you're like, holy crap, there's a lot of different options to choose from here. And that's the same thing everybody deals with when deciding to upgrade all their lighting in their facility. So you have, you have an LED lamp that upgrades, so a fluorescent, LE, uh, fluorescent tube typically costs about, I don't know, $1.50 to $2 right now. And you can buy an LED lamp that just, you pull out the fluorescent one, put an LED lamp in, and it cuts your energy in half, and that costs about $10 right now. So you're going to pay, you know, I don't know, what, what is that, like 400% or whatever it is, um, to upgrade to that. And that ROI, we, I don't know the ROI numbers, but I always know that the payback numbers are usually around five years for those LED lamps. Um, if, if we're installing it. If you're installing it yourself, it's like two years. It's pretty, it's pretty low. Uh, and then you can go to new, there's like LED retro kits, which are around $100. So 
that's your next step up. So that's a much more expensive, but they provide um, a wider array of abilities, dim ability, um, reducing fixture counts, better aesthetics. You know, you want something that looks new, right? And then from there, and I know everything on a classroom because we do a lot of schools. So a typical classroom for those LED lamps is about a thousand bucks. For the retro kits is about two thousand bucks. For brand new fixtures, it's about twenty eight hundred bucks. And for these LED um, tunables, it's about four thousand. So, and in terms of payback, you're talking five years, eight years, ten years, and then fifteen or so for those. So that's that's the general numbers. That's extremely general. <laughs> um, but does that kind of answer? Yeah. Do you guys do anything where you go, okay? Like let's say a company like mine where it's it's a bigger company and we're doing a rebuild of a couple of the branches now. Do you guys ever go, okay, hey, will you test this out for us, see how it goes, and then if all of a sudden that's good, I understand what you're saying, it's a five hundred thousand dollar sale right now versus, you know, someone doing one thing at one branch just to see if it works. The thing is that if it works in that and does a good like ROI on it, all of a sudden you have a company that spans Right. eight, ten states. They're like, okay, hey, this worked. <laughs> Let's, Let's do out. this kind of thing. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it kind of blows up for you real good. So have you guys ever considered just saying, hey, this company that's expanding, would you consider putting these in? We'll pay for it or anything like that? We've Just to kind of move yeah. the word. We've done that. We've done that before. Well, that's what the nursing home is, too, to yeah. be quite honest. They're part of the Gunderson chain. Yeah, yeah it's just a little yeah. different because it's not, not to interrupt you, I apologize. It's just, <laughs> They're, they're, they're aiming at little different things. Mm -hmm. So although you could look at it and go, if the nursing home thing is great, that'd be fantastic. I've got two grandparents in nursing homes and worry about that all the time. So that's really cool. It's just for the industrial side and the retail side, they're gonna look to see, hey, does our employees feel better about it? Do the customers feel better about it? Things like that. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah. So, and we're a small company, so it's where you spend your time, right? Where can you get your biggest bang for your dollar? <laughs> What we have found in the private sector is there's usually a payback threshold that says this has to pay for itself in under five years or under ten years or whatever, or else we're not going to do it. You know, um, like for instance, Kraft when it was still here, we proposed a project to them. Everything, all brand new LEDs, pays for itself in two and a half years, and it was, I don't know, like eight hundred thousand dollars. And they were like, we need it to be two years, and we said, well, it's two and a half. Like we can't. This we're not even making money on this project. And they're like, sorry. You know, and you spend a month developing something of that size, and then you have to walk away from it. Uh, the so a better filtering process on who we actually talk to would be a uh, uh, a better option for building that that business, that industrial side. It's just that you know um, we found that the public sector their payback requirements are usually up to 16 years, so you can do a lot with that versus the private sector. It's usually, you know, in the lower five or below. Um, and healthcare is is around that five mark too. But healthcare is on twenty four seven, so there's a really high burn rate hours on everything. So they use a lot of energy. I think we had a question back here. So uh, I think the interesting thing that you guys are coming up with, which um, is happening here, is there's actually a very different interest for both you guys. The sale here. I mean, if you're selling, you should be selling to parking garages, right? Because those guys, you can put in the most basic LED lights and get a payback in two years, and they still charge. I mean, they make a lot of money. I have friends who do that. I mean, and I don't know if you're if you're actually making your own or you guys are just buying and, and you're a reseller. Because if you can get through the whole supply chain, I have a friend of mine who does this, and he goes in and says the payback's 18 months. And these parking garage people love it because they're like, well, that's great, you know? So you're, what you're trying to solve is, if you're trying to run a business, you should find those sectors where you can do that two to three year payback if you can get the, get it there, but with with what you're with what you're presenting there, um, I would it's pretty hard for a school to think in a ten to fifteen year payback schedule. I mean, because they're going to look at that and the first thing they're going to say is technology isn't changing in five years. So they're 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 at the early stages of it, and then the next five years, someone's going to come in and go, hey, you have a payback schedule here of fifteen years. I mean, that's a lot. I mean, think about what's happened fifteen years from the light from today to what it was 15 years ago. I mean, a lot has changed. So I think that the sell for your side of it is gonna have to show ROIs as it relates to falls, as it relates to all these other things, and those are harder numbers to prove. And the other things, I don't know how tightly you guys are kind of integrated. I know you're, you're, the vision of trying to go everywhere is, is 
it's great. And if that's the case, you should just find resellers that are willing to pay you $100 or $1,000 a year just to say that they want your information, they want all your stuff, they want your, your studies, they want your scores, they want to be on your product or on your website. If you guys are really tightly integrated, then your information is really important only to him, right? Because like there's a data company out there that I know of, it's a nonprofit, and it used to sell, you just give that data away to a lot of people, and it wasn't making nearly as much money as when it created a for-profit sister entity and just said, we're giving this data only to this one entity. And so that's where you have to figure out, is this really valuable to you and you guys are really tightly integrated and that's why? Or is it really valuable to a lot of people and then go charge $100 or $1,000 a year and get all these resellers to take all your information and use it? That, that would be my thought. Well, I have a lot of friends with special needs education. So, you know, there's a business aspect of return on investment, but I think your focus on return on investment is immediate. If you're really de-escalating situations, if you really are taking pictures out of harm's way, I mean, that's amazing, because I, I have friends who, on a weekly basis, say they have chairs thrown at them. So, because of the fact that they're educating these children who are really influenced by external sources and don't have that control like we would. So, um, I think, that's a good focus for you. I think it's an excellent presentation. <coughs> well, and that was my question too about ROI. When you were talking ROI, that was a hard ROI payback number based on lifespan, energy usage, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Does it roll in any of the soft ROI of that? Productivity is the main thing I've been thinking of, right. particularly in a service economy. Mm -hmm. You know, the majority of operating budgets right now is on staff. And so if you're even able to increase productivity by 10 to 20 percent, you'd be able to have a real, really good soft right. ROI. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like a absentee is yep. someone who's not out because they're nursing a bad leg injury from a thrown chair. That's not someone you have to replace in the classroom. You know? Right. Yeah, and those, those soft ROIs are hard to translate to dollars. So that's the thing is when your CFO is looking at it, which ultimately in all of our projects they make the call, you got to translate that soft ROI to dollars somehow, and well, we haven't and found a way to do that. That goes to your question about a, a beta test site at a <coughs> old national bank has a yeah. national nationwide footprint. You get the in, tacit endorsement of that. That helps harden your soft ROI. Right. If they can yeah, say that's what our, I'm talking about. our absenteeism went down 20% in a year, yeah. boom, that's ROI right there. Yeah, and in this in the service sector now, they I'm sure you've all noticed that staffing levels go down and down and down as things go so you need people to be more and more and more on point all the time and that's where I think your research comes into play where you go okay it's as simple as I can switch what color the light is and it makes you know keeps everybody awake all day as opposed to just slamming coffee and doing whatever at three o'clock you're passing out that to me is where the value lies. it's not the I, I mean I'm fairly low on this rung of people in this company. So when I look at it, I don't go, well, okay, the LED lights saved 50 cents today over the course of anything, but I could say that my staff actually stayed, stayed awake, stayed productive the whole time. And to me, that means a ton. Right. You and make up the savings just on the box. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the box. <laughs> I don't have to go to Starbucks three times. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I yeah. Well, in your case, uh, numeric entry mistakes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's got to be like, I mean, hospitals, um, medical errors is the third leading cause of mortality in the United States. Oh That's got a real number associated with it to a hospital, because if you make an error, you're going to get sued, right, or a certain percentage of the time. So that one, I definitely see a number coming out of the falls. My, my problem on the falls is that it's got a real number connotated to Medicare. But for the nursing home right now, they're not fined for that. Yeah, I was going to say, with the nursing homes, you need to really make, because they don't ultimately reap any true economical benefit from the reduced falls for the most part. That's going to be the insurance company that Medicare is contracting with. So it sounds like you're working with Gunderson, which is good, because that's a provider-owned plan. Those are exactly the types you need to reach out to is the ones where the insurance company is the provider and owns the nursing home because then they do reap that immediate benefit. I think we have time for one more question or comments. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to touch base um, on a question that was asked earlier, in, because you said something about um, you don't sell things because you're a nonprofit, and that's not really true. Um, nonprofits can sell things all the time, and so I think that kind of what you need to figure out is who do you want to sell to, and sort of how how much you want to sell it for. Like, if you are selling to, you know, is your end consumer the people that you're actually talking to, and the, you know, are you selling this to the hospitals and the schools and everything else, or are you selling this to the lighting companies themselves? And once you can figure out who your actual customers are, I think that it will be much clearer what you can sell, how much you can sell it for, and where your actual funding stream is going to come from to pay for all the rest of this research. And how you can better support your customer. Yes. Yeah. And like, I mean, ultimately, that will all trickle down to the end, um, the end consumer. But, you know, if you're, and I know that you've talked about like the lighting installers, but I'm sure that the companies that are actually producing these lights and the light switches and who, you know, I'm assuming that you're buying it from somebody who's, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that they would love this information because if they can sell a, you know, $20 fixture as opposed to a $1.50 fixture, that's huge for them. And so, I mean, I know that sort of raises some ethical concerns about being funded by the company that you're providing the research for. But, um, I mean, again, it's just another <coughs> idea for ways to get funding for the research going forward. Thank you. As usual, I feel like this discussion could probably go on all day. We should probably bring like more coffee and more food in, but uh, unfortunately, we got to get going. Emma, thank you so much. This was great. Um, as always, you know, excellent presentation, great Q and A. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out. Thank you to Field Fifty Nine, Old National Bank, Crescendo Library. Um, maybe you can stick around for a couple minutes and follow up with people, and uh, look forward to seeing you all here next week.